Okay, we'll get started. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. All right, we're going to talk about a little bit about practical dynamic application security testing with your interface. Okay, clear it out. Yeah. So about myself, I'm the most goal I work at Verizon. I've been there about six years. Um, I do a lot of their mobile and web application pen testing. Um, then I got thrown into automation. So that's basically what we're presenting today, a lot of automation work we've been doing for the dynamic side of security testing. Still explain cool I work. I don't know why. Some people still don't get it, but we're the people they come to to understand security issues. So. Um, interest in IoT security. Uh, I hack around my Raspberry Pi at home and I enjoy speaking. Hey everyone, I'm Nicholas Kenny, and I'm on the same team as Nick Dole here. And I also do DevSecOps, or SecDevOps, or whatever you feel like calling it. Uh, and I also do pen testing for the team as well. Um, outside of work here, I do a lot of password security reading on blogs and things like that. Uh, read a lot about car hacking, and I'm a big cyclist, so if you want to talk bicycles, come to me. I'm totally in love with them. But I've been at Verizon for about uh, four years now. I started off as a PHP developer, then became a Java developer, and finally made the switch to security about two, two and a half years ago now. So it's, uh, it's been a pretty good journey. Yeah. We're going to talk about two terms today, AST, application security testing, and OST, operational security testing. We'll get into how they are different and complement each other, and the two solutions that we'll present today. So AST, to give a quick overview, we're working within the CICD pipeline and automating the dynamic security testing. So ultimately, just putting application security in the pipeline is only one step of kind of a multi-dimensional approach to security. You, you know, there's a lot of bases to have covered here. And you know, I just want to take a quick poll. How many uh, you know, pen testers are in the room right now, just by show of hands? Yeah, uh, network engineers, site reliability engineers maybe, a few of you, okay. And just straight up AppSec people. I'm guessing I should see all the hands almost here. <laughs> yeah, so everyone, you know, is doing something different and can contribute to this process of security. Yeah, so all those hands we just saw, each person has a part of this process we're about to discuss. So when I walk into the room of a development discussion, and they want to talk about security in the pipeline. These are the, the things I think they're thinking about. So the way I portray it is when I talk to developers, you know, security shouldn't be breaking your pipeline, nor should they be disrupting your building process. We want to work alongside with you, and you have to find the right solution for your group. To do a quick overview of some differences, uh, most of us probably know all the differences of SAS versus NAS, but you know, I'll play the SAS part and Nick's going to cover the DAS. So the first one, white box, the SAS tools, they can see everything about the application when they're running. They can get a lot of the vulnerabilities directly from seeing everything as opposed to... Yeah, where DAS, it's a black box. You don't know what's going on. You have no idea what code's running except anything that you gain from your pen testing or reconnaissance on the site itself. You, you don't have that full look at all the code that's running there. Yep. And SAS, you get to see all the source code. Uh, you need the code to run the tools. And for DAST, you just need that running application. Like I said, it's fully deployed. The, everything in stack is going at this point. For implementation, um, I have found that it's less time consuming to implement the SAS tool. Generally, you just need the source code or uh, you wrap the build script and the tool can accumulate the vulnerabilities and provide a report to you. Yeah, and obviously for DAS you need qualified pen testers, uh, you know, scanning tools that may or may not be licensed. It's just gonna take a lot more time to implement that entire process into your enterprise or company situation. Yeah, and you need the running application. So it's a lot more involved than just running a SAS tool. Um, finally, you find more vulnerabilities earlier with SAS because your first step is almost is compiling the code. Uh, even the tools today, you can find the code, you can find vulnerabilities using a SAS tool as you're typing an ID. Yeah, that's definitely a good point right there because 
You know, you can find it in development. You don't even need to have your app completed. Whereas DAS, yeah, you need something that compiles and runs and is functional. So we'll get into the ASD solution. Uh, we use the automated test cases to strategically pinpoint what we want to be, what we want tested. Uh, historically, when you're using a, a dynamic tool, you're providing a URL to the scanner, you throw a macro in there, or a script for authentication, or you're injecting a token into the process. Uh, so the scanner will start crawling. A lot of times, I've seen it gets maybe stuck in a loop. I, I never know when the scan really wants to complete. Sometimes it'll complete, but you're not sure if it tested all the parts you want to test it, possibly the new payment flow of your application. Um, so that's a, a con that we've seen when you're just throwing your URL at, at a scanner. <coughs> to show a generic flow of a CI CD process, you know, you're compiling the code, you're going to deploy the application along with your scanner, then you need those functional test cases to drive your scanner. Those can be a full regression suite or that new, new feature you just developed. And then you're exploring the results. Exploring the results is one of the most important parts of the process. It's, you know, it's great that you can get the scanners running. It's great that you can funnel all the functional test cases into your proxy or scanner tool. But if you're not getting those results in front of development or whoever's fixing the issue with development, uh, it's, it's worthless if you're not doing that. So we'll get into that as well. So why would you use AST? Manual pen testing has not been feasible for quite some time. It's, we still do it. It's just that the features are rolling out so fast, it's not feasible to test every small feature or release. If you have multiple releases a week, you can't pull a tester out to test that one little feature each single time. Just like I said, the frequency increased. So before, maybe I would be testing one application once a week. Now that's increased to maybe three times or four times a week. Making life easier, why not automate what you can? You know, push a lot of this to the development side, and they have to basically own part of the dynamic security testing. You're reducing the number of vulnerabilities. So in a sense that when an application gets to me, uh, usually it's later on in the process, hopefully they ran this automated test cases against the scanner multiple times. It should have at least caught the loading and proved if uh, you're paying attention to the scanner. And you know, it will be, be created to for you as your scanner. So one of my uh, favorite slide club episodes, if you don't know Newman, works for the post office. Uh, I kind of related, I kept thinking about this as I was testing, so I get in in the morning, there's a few of assessments I need to work on. I work on five, another ten come in, I work on another three, another three come in. And it just, it almost it felt like I was living Newman's life as the mail keeps coming in, you couldn't get enough out, and then they just kept piling in. So there had to be a better way, which is, you need to log your process. Not to mention for our kind of people, you know, pen testers, it's hard to find pen testers. You can't just go out and say, oh, we're going to hire 50 tomorrow. It's just not possible. So we don't want to stop development. We just want to redirect them at the right time. So as you can see, a lot of the tomatoes are coming down as kicking back the green ones. So if you can almost think of it as developers finding the vulnerabilities up front and they're kicking back those bills before they reach their private environment. So another part of that is shifting left is a, a term everyone's been using. We want development to take ownership a lot of a lot of the security that's done up front. So how are we going to do this? Basically the solution needs to be fast. No one wants to wait around for your testing to complete. We're shifting left, as I said, development needs to see those up front because we don't want to be the gatekeeper that's blocking that from deploying your application. And it needs to be easy to integrate into your pipeline. We'll show a few techniques that we use to help us get through that process. So we'll get into some of the details. I don't have all of the icons of Jenkins and everything because that's really up to your environment. I didn't want to portray a certain tool chain that you need to use. But we'll get into some of those. So deploy code, you run the static analyzer. I don't think I'm going to see this. But, uh, 
next you're deploying UAT, and then you're deploying the scanner with the same tools that you, your application teams have deployed to UAT. So, basically, doesn't really show up yeah, on air. Sorry. Yeah. So Terraform or Too bright. Automation, if you're deploying to AWS or Terraform, if you want to use something cloud agnostic, you can deploy um, your instance, per se, or your container, whatever you need to do. Um, Ansible, Chef, or Puppet, if, when we're doing our configuration management, so configuring our, our scanner. So when we're, after the instance up, we pass the URL to the scanner. Jenkins configures the scanner on the port. We'll get into some of those more details. So that's automating the tool chain for us for deploying the scanner. Our factory is housing our scanner binaries. So Jenkins has a place to pull it from. Or SVN or GET, whatever you need to use to pull any configurations as well. So automating your test cases, this is this needs to happen. So if your development isn't creating those automated test cases, there won't be anything to drive your scanner. Do those testing. So we're we're really just, we really want to pinpoint those new changes on a frequent basis. And the security CLI is a tool Nick and I have developed in house to interact with the scanner API. This allows for an easier integration for each application team. They don't have to configure or write their own scripts to interact with the scanner that we deploy. So it's an easy command line. We'll show the integration for that as well. But some of the commands are uh, start the scanner. You want to set a context. You don't want your scanner to be going outside the scope. Spider URL, attacking the URL, alerts, which will you can have it set to send the alerts to screen, or you can have it sent to a Jira system uh, and shut down the scanner once you're done. Now that you through that, so get your results and shut down. It's simplistic. We wanted to show it wasn't. It's not that hard. You just need to embed yourself in the same tool chain as your development. So I pulled an entry from our artifact that we config when we're deploying staff. So we do use a lot of containerization. I just took that out because it's not really needed. So you're, you're starting staff in, in David mode on the host. Your, your uh, confirmation or Terraform will be exporting the host name that was configured for you. And then you're starting up a port number. These two items will need to be passed to your automated test cases, because our automated test cases need to be proxied through that scanner. Also, some config that we thought were useful. We're starting to get proxy in attack mode, we're saying that the true and new mode equals attack. This means that every time you send a request to that scanner, it's going to throw all the attacks at it. So you don't need to call the CLI for a spider or attack. It's automatically going to do that for you, which is a nice feature that actually has. The next one is your API key. We set an API key in our Jenkins process. So upon startup, we embed that API key at the startup script that you see here. Um, should be a common practice for everyone here. Uh, let's see. Config connection proxy chain. So proxy chain hosting is an important feature that we actually found out why our scanner kept throwing 500 is because the applications were behind another proxy. So you're just chaining your proxy with another proxy to get to the application. You may need this, you may not. It depends on your environment, but that's how we need it to work on it. Uh, config proxy chain, that's just a boolean true or false. And then any add-ons, that's important actually. So if, if you're having a lot of trouble with DOM process scripting or cross site request forgery, Zap has the features to install additional third-party add-ons or even fully supported add-ons provided by Google. And then finally, as your test cases are running, the development or QA team can interact with the with the scanner with the CLI. So a few of the options are you can just call the jar file. It's, it's everybody knows what a command line interface looks like. You call the command, you use the web application, the scanner host scanner for an API key. This is what you were using to build that API call within our client. So I guess we'll go over one of the important ones. We'll go over the third one from the top. Context, because at every start of the test, we make development set in context. So this will set the scope. Basically, you just provide the URL to the application, and then just the IP and port number to your scanner. It would be API key, and that's it. It sets it, and now they're ready to start attacking your application. Then if you're not setting the attack equal to true, you can individually test the URL if you're like using the client. Finally, uh, alerts will dump out a JSON report or HTML, or it will send it to your Jira project. And shut down once all your vulnerabilities have been out. And this is the 
this is an example from one of our zero projects. This is the header of the scanner tool that did the scan. Um, the copy name I blacked out was not really necessary. So this one particular one, uh, cross-site scripting connection not enabled. There is no attack for this. It's really just a passive check. But it shows the solution that the developer could use to correct this issue. But likewise, if it was a cross-site scripting or SQL injection or something of the sort, it would show the actual attack that was committed from that. Thank you. So the second method we're gonna talk about here is called, we're calling operational security testing. And in this method, we're gonna leverage data retrieved from logging tools such as Splunk, T-Leaf, Site Catalyst, anything that can basically collect URLs. And we're gonna perform quick passive scans against all that data. We're gonna hit all those URLs and scan all of them. Because ultimately, you wanna know your security posture, and by doing passive scans, you're able to hit prod URLs, since you're not injecting any kind of attack into it. You don't have to worry about destroying your environment or possibly repeating an attack or anything like that. So an overview of this process would be you start with a security dashboard, and a security dashboard would essentially have all your information about your application's current security posture. You know, how many vulnerabilities are currently in it, uh, if you want to initiate some kind of automated web assessment of it or a manual web assessment of it, things like that. And just the URL and all the, uh, the application and all the URLs for that application. So your security dashboard would then make a call out to a DAST API that we created and say, you know, scan these URLs. These are what were found through our logging tools. And the API would pass that to a controller, which would then be delegating that work to containers with scanners within them to scan groups of URLs. So we do utilize containers within this in order to speed up the process of scanning this large amount of URLs, because you could have in the thousands. You know, If you have 1,000 applications and they each have you know, 20 URLs, anywhere from one to 20 URLs, if not even more, you gotta be able to move this thing along. And finally, you're gonna, after those containers finish scanning those URLs, you're gonna get your results and push it back to the security dashboard to create a feedback loop. So you have one spot, the security dashboard, where you can view all the vulnerabilities and all your applications. And simultaneously, you can push that to JIRA for the developers and whatnot and enable them to act upon that information in order to correct any vulnerabilities found. So with this approach, what we're essentially doing is casting a wide net. You know, you're not gonna catch any of the SQL injections or you know, a lot of the cross-site scriptings just because these are passive checks, but you will be catching misconfigurations, things like uh, cookies not set to secure or you know, TLS is not enabled, things like that. And you will be catching a lot of the smaller fish, which in and of itself provides a lot of value because those are often you know, ways attackers get their foot in the door to exploit greater things. Yeah, if developers are making those small checks, then why would they make it part of the role that they Yep. So why do you need this in your pipeline? You quickly assess the security posture of your production applications. Being able to know what prod looks like very quickly, you know, clicking a button and two hours later knowing what vulnerabilities are on your prod URLs provides a lot of value to you. You're able to run that multiple times a day if you choose to. It increases your coverage over the application security testing solution that Nick covered. You know, anything happens when you're pushing to prod multiple times a day. Sometimes people add stuff to you know, their git commit, they comment out something, they don't think about it. Literally anything can happen there. So you always wanna check in your UAT, your staging environment. You could even run this within your dev environments. And yes, finally, in prod, of course. And you can also use it to verify any web app security requirements that are part of your own corporate policy. So you know, if you have a requirement, every page should use TLS, or every cookie should be set to secure, use HTTP only. You can verify that those requirements are being met with this and provide that information back to your developers in order to remedy that. And it's compatible with all web apps. So there's actually an asterisk on that one because we currently do not support APIs, but that is in future. 
future development that we'll try to be covering towards the end of this. But yeah, all you need is a functioning web app. You know, you got a, a front page to that thing, we can scan it with this. So how do you implement this? Your solution needs to meet several criteria. Uh, number one, it has to be fast. Like I said, you're dealing with a vast amount of URLs and a vast amount of data, and you're doing scanning on an enormous scale. So if something takes two minutes to scan, two minutes times you know, 10,000 URLs, that's a long time. So you gotta be able to work fast here. Has to be safe. Uh, you know, injection attacks come in through URLs all the time and your logging tool might not clean that up for you. So you might be repeating attacks against your own servers if you know you got and one equals one appended to the end of a URL. So you gotta be sanitizing these things and keeping it clean. It also has to be non-invasive. That allows you the functionality to use this on prod and cloud environments and not have to worry that you're going to break something by accident. It should also be autonomous. That way, this is something you can kick off, fire and forget, and be getting results back constantly. You don't want to siphon resources away from your dev teams. I mean, I'm sure many of you know, you go to the dev team and tell them they have to do something. That's gonna get back to the business people who are most of the time just saying more features, more features. And it's gonna be very hard to you know, fight that battle with them. So if you can do something like this, which is almost completely independent of the dev team, it's, it's an easy sell for management. And like I said before, it's complementary to the other solution. It doesn't you know, interfere with that one at all, which just increases your overall coverage. So I'm gonna go over a detailed kind of diagram of how this works now. We have the start with the log collectors, your anything that could be like a seam or like I said, tea leaf, site catalyst, whatever you use, even a custom log collector. And your security dashboard is gonna be sourcing those URLs. So basically it needs the ability to pull in URLs from your log collectors. And eventually it's gonna need the ability to just parse JSON files, which will be your results later, and publish it to itself. So it, yeah, it will need a tiny API attached to it. From there, your security dashboard, you could set it on a cron or anything like that, or just manually make these calls to the DAST API and be passing your uh, URLs along to it. And the API, here's a sample of the API we wrote. It's kind of hard to read. Like I said, I apologize for that. But uh, it's got a few functions. In the first box there, it says bulk scan and scan. Bulk scan would be the one you'd probably primarily use, which is to scan you know, multiple URLs and regular scan just for a single URL if you wanted to just check new things as they came in to the log collectors or anything like that. The second box is just a status and results. So after you submit to bulk scan or scan, you'd get a unique identifier for that scan and you'd be able to submit it to status to see how far along that scan is or to the results endpoint and see what the results were for that scan. So hitting status would tell you, you know, you submitted 200 URLs, this has done 150 of those. So just so, you know, in case you initiate something, you know how far along it is. And the last container, or the last box is container commands, which I'll get into a little bit more after Nick explains some containers, that stuff that we're working on. So you get your URLs, you pass them to bulk scan, and that is gonna pass it to a controller after sanitizing those URLs and all that good stuff. And your controller is basically going to be delegating the work. It's gonna be breaking these URLs up into groups by application, and it is going to be starting up containers and passing it to these containers, which will then be doing the actual scanning. And this is also where you would use something probably like a Elastic Container Service or Kubernetes or something like that to essentially load balance this operation we have going on here. So Nick's gonna explain a little bit about our container situation. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, basically, we need scalability. Uh, we've had thousands of URLs from our uh, director come to us, hey, we have all these URLs, we need to scan and we need to be asynchronous. Okay, so uh, you can fire up as many containers as you want and our controller, maybe we'll get more of a logic, but uh, we'll start as many as we need to get to this process that I did uh, Basically, <clears throat> we'll just take an example. If there's a scan request that's sent to the controller, the controller will get the application 
I'd also like to just mention that you're not limited to, you know, like Zap. You could use basically any scanner that supports passive scanning and, you know, have a deployment script written within a container because that's all you really need is, you know, any proxy information and just a basic script for that container to run and pull in any dependencies that it might need in order to scan, you know, proxy chain information and, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, this is super hard to see with the lights on this, but um, it's basically a sample request for the bulk scan. Uh, I'll just point out here. It's um, just a post request, very simple. You know, you could do this from uh, advanced REST client, Postman, whatever. And in this JSON body here, all, or payload, all you have is two apps, each with two URLs. So you could submit multiple applications and their URLs in one payload to this thing. And only thing that it needs is an application ID and the URLs that you wish to have scanned. So pretty, pretty simple to do. And all you would get back would be you know, a response message or error message and your unique scan ID, which in this example is ABC123. So, this data flow just kind of explains how it actually goes about that. Your, your API gets the initial request JSON, and it'll return ABC123 as the scan ID. And your controller then is going to break that apart into your two applications that were w included within the payload. It's going to have your application one and application two, and make those two JSON files separate, or create two separate JSON files. And from there, you're, it's going to pass each of those JSON files to a container that's named or tagged with the scan ID and the application ID. Because obviously, at some point, you're going to be scanning the same application again and again, and you need unique identifiers for that purpose. So you're going to combine those things. And if you remember on the previous slide, there were container-specific commands that you could run. There was, you know, stop, pause, resume, but ultimately anything you want to build in, you're able to, because you can re reference a specific container and act upon that from your security dashboard since you have both the app ID and the container ID. So if you wanted to stop a scan halfway through or pause it for, you know, oh, this app is going down for maintenance right now and we don't want to be running a scan on it, anything like that, and you're able to do that. Or you can even reference groups of containers by just calling you know, the ABC123 and reference the entire scan and all the containers associated with it. And yeah, this is also very hard to read, but it is just a sample results page that has the application ID. You would get one back for each application since the URLs are grouped by application, which is very nice for developers and for complex sites where, you know, if you have a site where uh, the front page is maintained by one app team, and the blog is maintained by another app team, and the shopping cart's maintained by another app team. You can actually get reports back specific to the parts of that site. And with this situation here, yeah, you would just get all your passive checks back telling you what URL it was, and, you know, host name and port and all that. So, I hope everyone can kind of see how we're filling the gap here, where AST leaves off, OST has been picking up. A lot of applications aren't using all the automated test cases that we might have been using, so OST, we're able to leverage uh, some of the functionality from that. Uh, a lot of the pen testing is not feasible to keep up with the application development. Um, and it also hasn't been a way to quickly assess 
find several applications at first. So always think about the rest of that. Yeah. Ultimately, it is about covering the gap because you can have people run, uh, you know, zap, web inspect, and do a full scan on something, and it will take a while. But these are much faster methods, and I do recommend running full scans on things. But in order to keep up with that CI/CD environment and how fast it's just going, you you need to you know work around that because, like we said earlier, you can't break their pipeline. It's just not something people are going to accept at this point. So this day, conclusion: We've been using that to get into the CI/CD process. We needed our security team to become more agile, which this is helping us do. Um, and also, we have so many applications at Verizon, we needed a way to find compliance between all the web apps. So being able to quickly scan and get an assessment back has helped us understand the uh, vulnerabilities in the landscape. Yeah, and we did it because, yeah, you need to be agile in security. You can't be the roadblock. You can't just keep stopping development anytime you think something's wrong. You have to be able to keep up with them and all their releases. Uh, ultimately, yeah, we made it agnostic. That way, this works on any platform. You're not restricted to specific scanners or tools. You can use multiple scanners if you want and get more comprehensive results. It, it's really very open. This is just a general roadmap that you could look at and maybe base your own security off of. And finally, saving time. I mean, you can't keep up. There's you know how many pen testers and how many applications and how many changes going into those applications, the math just doesn't work out, and it's not there for us. So you have to develop something to help you with that. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, so thank you.